is not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. You know, this is a long time coming because we've known each other for a long time. Yeah. For the first time on the podcast, for the first time in the Not Sam studio, the Boricua Beast, right. Dan Moff is here. And I was thinking about my earliest memory of, of interacting with you. And I think, I think that the first time that I interacted with you was at a Jersey All Pro show, obviously. Definitely. And I had come in and they were like, Sam, you and Mark have to go get promos. Mark Clemson was the guy who was doing commentary. And, like, I didn't know anything about anything. God bless Mark Clemson, who, like, just walked me through everything. Here's what this means. Here's what we're going to do, blah, blah, blah. Because by that time, Jersey All Pro was such an established organization that, you know, it was a it was a family. It was a club. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, let me just. And so they were like, okay, go over to Moff and get a promo with Moff. I was like, okay. And I went over to you. Did they giggle when they? <laughs> yeah, because they knew. I didn't know, but they knew. And so I was like, "Oh, we're gonna do a promo." And you're like, "Okay, all right, we'll do a promo." And I go, "They go, prime time, Sam Roberts here with damn off, damn off tonight." But and you grabbed the mic and you said, "Get out of my face!" And you grabbed me and threw me into a pile of steel chairs and just did the promo straight to camera. <laughs> And I and here's what struck me. First of all, I'm is I'm lying there next to the chairs. I'm like, you better sell this for as long, <laughs> for as long <laughs> as this lasts, because the the minute you get up, he's gonna put you right back down. <laughs> but what struck me is, so you do this thing. You went from off to on like that, right? You were ready mm. to throw me into the chairs. You went, and after you had thrown me. You did this probably, I mean, you could go on for five minutes, you could go 10 minutes, you could go 15 minutes, however long anybody needs, right? But you did this promo into the camera. I don't even remember what it was about, but it was, like all your promos, angry, intense, just, ugh. And the minute the camera went off, you started laughing again. I'm like, hey, man, you okay? And like, it, and you're back to this jovial guy. And like, and I've watched you through the years, and, and that's you. Like, the intensity that you put on, I think, is is one of your trademarks. Have you gotten it to a point now where that's really the way it works? You turn on and turn off like that? Um, I think it's more of a comfort zone. Mm. Um, when you allow me to to be what I'm comfortable showing. <laughs> You know, um, I just don't want to be like the rest of the pack. I don't want to go out there and say, hey, this Saturday night, I'm going to meet you and I'm going to beat you up. Yeah. And, um, buy a ticket. You know, I want to be a little different. I want to, um, you know, I want to be intense. I want to have a, a, a sense of, of realism. In it. And I also think about, before I cut a promo, I think about a lot of things that have happened to me. Right, so it comes from a real place. They make me angry, so it comes from a real place, and I try to, I try to um, channel the promo into something that's really happened to me. Yeah, no, I mean I get that because every time you cut one of these promos, it seems like, no, 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 no. I know all this is wrestling, but you've crossed a line right now, mm-hmm. and everything just got real. And there's a believability there. So, like, when you go out to the ring, obviously when you cut a promo, that's one thing. But when you go out to the ring, you have to embody that, right? Like, like that has to translate. You don't have words anymore. So that has to translate from the way you look, your eyes, your body language. Immediately, as soon as you walk out of the curtain, that guy in that promo has to translate to the audience that that's the real guy. So how long does it take you before you go out through the curtain to kind of get into that space where you're thinking about the things that make you angry, where you're kind of, you know, getting to that place. Well, when you're working in front of a live, when you're live in a color, working in front of a live uh, audience, it's totally different. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to focus on what you're delivering. You got to focus on, um, okay, what is the main thing? What's the main objective? What's the main line that we want to hit? In this promo, um, what are the key elements of the promo? 
you gotta focus but uh, you also have to i also like to put myself in the moment yeah yeah um i like to put myself in the moment and i like to be in the moment instead of just um playing along in the moment i like to put myself in the moment does that make sense completely yeah so um which is difficult to do because if you're in the moment and you also have to remember because a promo by nature is a promotional thing you're you're selling something when you're in the ring when you're in front of the audience that's the product that you've been selling now we get to do this thing but a promo while it's part of the art of everything it's also that's the selling part right that's where i'm trying to convince you to come to the show, to buy the DVD, to do the thing. So when you're in that moment and you have to remember, I secretly have to be a salesman here. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, you have to balance those two, right? And I don't think there's ever a perfect promo. Mm -hmm. I think there's always a promo where you you say, "Ah, I shouldn't have said that. Or, oh man, I, I paused that second or (laughs) I should have said this or I should have said that. You know, but it's uh, usually, I usually get the, Hey man, you know, you nailed it. You know, but there's sometimes where I'm like, oh my god, that was terrible. It was like, you know, no, it wasn't. It was like, <laughs> like, <sighs> but in your head, you're going because you're focusing on that little thing, right? And now, now that I remember, like a lot of the promos that they would send you to do with me, yeah, they would send them in awkward moments. I mean, the most awkward. Yeah, but that's what made our stuff so good, right? Because it was it was like authentic. Like it would literally be either sometimes intermission when you're trying to figure out like okay maybe you're the first match after intermission Mm -hmm. it would be right after the show where you're still on that adrenaline high Mm -hmm. and at the same time like the ring's getting torn down and 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 you know all these emotions are just flooding through and it's like hey talk to me about the next match talk to me about what happened in this match they would send you but they would all watch (laughs) (laughs) they say watch this yeah (laughs) yeah you know and they you would just go and and listen to your God bless you, man. You were aggressive and you were professional and you knew and you knew enough at that point. He's like, all right, I'm gonna something's gonna happen here. Cause I just react. I'm just like I go off the cuff and yeah. just react naturally to me. It's the same as just don't worry about nothing. Trust me, I'm never gonna hurt you, but just act natural that's it and you would ask me things and then uh, i would like my headache with you was your hair <laughs> that's right? Right. Yeah. right yeah i was saying yeah. i would i would be cutting a promo and all of a sudden i would go back to your hair like it was almost like me just standing there and my hair being my hair yeah like you are distracted i'm trying to deliver this message and that hair is bothering me <laughs> yeah <laughs> and even 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 kenny remember that was the, the kenny omega days yeah yeah, yeah. And, and kenny would say Man, we had great chemistry with that guy <laughs> because we would just we would go with each other, and yeah. then I would go back to you and say that hair, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it was awesome, like I said. Yeah, it was it was it was it was an amazing time, and I, yeah, I mean, I think back at all the people that were around then, and you talk about Kenny Omega, yeah. like it's 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 wild. All the people that had gone through Jersey All Pro. So for those that don't know, and I feel like in the last month or so there's been a whole new level of exposure to who you are and and what you do you know signing with ring of honor obviously a huge step and you know here on the east coast i think you've you know in the in the new york new jersey philadelphia area you've made a name for yourself completely on your own over the last 15 years yeah and it's almost one of those things where you were just our guy, right? And then all of a sudden, Ring of Honor scoops you up. Had you gotten to a place where you had settled in and said, okay, my career, because I'm sure, I'm sure when you start, you're going, I'm doing this right now, but then I'm going to go to WWE, and then I'm going to go to WrestleMania, and then I'm going to win the championship. Like, that's literally everybody's plan until life happens, and you go, okay, where do I actually fit in wrestling? And, you know, you start to see the whole business. Did you get to a place where you're like okay this is what i'm doing and this is good well um i got to a point where i, was, I just i settled i said you know this is what it's gonna be mm-hmm. um i was put here for a reason um and i was the things that have happened to me have all happened to me 
so I can be here for this moment, which is teaching younger kids and getting them ready for that next step to go to a possible um, interview for the WWE or an NXT tryout or, you know, um, that's where I met Pat Buck. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like meeting Pat Buck totally changed my life. Really? Um, yeah. Um, when I went to uh, Pro Wrestling Syndicate, which later turned on to turned into WrestlePro. Yeah. Um, just sitting under Pat Buck's learning tree and uh, seeing the different aspects because I I had come I had already I was already grizzled and on the I, I had been through the independent grind mm -hmm. as, as you could say but um i i also i learned as much as i could at jap from fat frank and then at ace um with mike morgan i was learning the different aspects of that's where i learned how to really cut a promo or how to um tell a story right how to really tell a story and how to how to how to take an angle and drag it out for eight months to a year and really get the most out of it. Which, by the way, an insanely difficult thing to do when you don't have television, right? Like you got to do this angle, which means that if you're dragging an angle out for eight months on the independence, you have to just have the faith that people are coming back to every show. Yeah. So that that's the only way you can really see the story. I mean, there were DVDs back then and everything, but that's really, you know, that's a small percentage. It was about the people that were coming to every show yeah. and then hopefully, right, telling their friends, hey, this thing happened at this show. You got to come with me next month because we're going to get to see the next chapter and whatever this is. Oh, man. Like, we were, I remember um, myself and Mo Sexton, mm -hmm. which is Mario Boker. Right? Yeah. Um, I, I met him at Ace, and Mike Morgan showed me. I was watching something, and I saw the way he took a super kick mm -hmm. from Jay Lethal mm -hmm. to end the show. And they ended the show that way, and people were leaving the venue, and he was still laying down the same way him I said I want to meet this guy I said I gotta Mike said no you got you have to work this guy he says this is the program that I want I said okay so lo and behold I was supposed to wrestle Steve Carino um Steve for one reason or another um couldn't show up um so Mike said listen there's no better time than the present let's do this now so I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? He says, let's do you and Sexton tonight. I said, there's maybe 35 people there. <laughs> but those 35 people were calling. Yeah. Other people was like, listen, it's happening tonight. <laughs> so before you knew it, there was like 125 people there. So people were showing up. Yes. Based on the fact, so they announced like beginning of the show or right before the show or whatever it is, hey, this is the match that's happening tonight. Yes. And people were like, well, we weren't going to go to the show, but let me... Right. Wow. Because it was such a tight-knit community. Yeah. In Union City. Yeah. It was in the neighborhood. It was right in the mix of the Latino neighborhood. So they're like, listen, this is going down right now. You have to get here. But isn't that interesting? And that's such a good lesson that, like, that those you guys have been built so well in those home independent groups that even when you had something like Steve Carino, who was kind of developed this name outside wow. and was coming in, because the general thinking is, well, we'll get these names from the outside, and they're the ones that are going to come in and, and draw, them, draw the money. The, the, people are going to buy tickets to see them. Absolutely. And what had happened was people bought tickets to see the guy, the match that they had wanted to see that had been built yes. over the course of, of shows. Yeah. So now we do the match, and we do a title change. It's like, oh my God, I was the place completely. Now, the next time, when I got there, there was 30 people. Mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Now, every show is sold out. That's wild. Now, every show is because they are totally hooked. Right. Because now, Moff has a problem with Sexton, and they're both baby faces. Right. And the crowd both loves them. But they hate each other. But they professionally respect each other, but they can't stand yes. each other. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because this guy wants to be the best, and this guy wants to be the best. Yeah. 
and this, you know, so like it, the angle was just told so incredibly. It was, it was just, it's the greatest angle I've ever done. Um, it ended. I up, love that. It's Hogan Warrior oh for Union God. City. And it, it was. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. Um, I don't think there's ever been an angle that I've ever been a part of. It was has been so emotionally invested than the angle between Mo Sexton, Danny Moff, and Matt Morgan. Mike Morgan at eighth. And why do you think that is? Like, why? Why is it? Is it just lightning in a bottle? Is it the the you can't? Would like why can't that be repeated into the next one and the next one and the next one? And the because Mike just had he had an incredible he has an incredible mind, mm -hmm. right? But he just needs the resources. He needs the right people mm -hmm. in the right place. So, well, so let's let's go back a little bit because I mean I think a lot of people who are around, you know, grew up in the generation that I grew up in, know, especially on the East Coast, no Jersey All-Pro. And I didn't even realize until recently that you, when you started teaming with Steve, with Monster Mac, Steve Mac, and you guys were the hit squad, that that was the first thing that you really did in wrestling. Oh, yeah. Like, I had known, obviously, when I came in and I met you, I knew you from the Hit Squad, I knew you from the history of Jersey All-Pro and everything. Right. But it wasn't until, like, it was when I was like, okay, I'm going to talk to him. I was like, what was he doing before Jersey All-Pro? And I was like, training. Nothing. Like, that was, you came in, and you, you, were, you were the Hit Squad, which was a big enough deal on the East Coast Indies that it actually brought you guys to Ring of Honor when Ring of Honor first started. Right. So it was a it, it was a huge deal. What is it like for somebody? I mean, you grew up with wrestling. Your dad was a promoter and a referee, and so wrestling's been around you forever. But you didn't know you were going to be a wrestler. No, my dad hated it. Right, right. So when you, what is it like for somebody who goes in for training? Didn't even realize they were going to be a wrestler. Goes to the training. It, obviously, you're a natural. You know, you're an athlete, and you grew up with it, and you love it. So. Those three things generally get a good product. Um, but when you get out of school and immediately you're a hit, right? Immediately the act is a hit. It's one of Jersey All Pro's biggest thing. This was a time when Jersey All Pro, I mean, literally Jersey All Pro was making so much news. You guys were on national news no. going like, this is the new controversial wrestling, blah, blah, blah. And you guys were a big part of that. You go to Ring of Honor, which is the, I mean, it's billing itself as the best of the best of the independents. That was the whole reason Ring of Honor existed. Were you able to stay on level ground? Were you able to go, okay, this is cool, but or were you kind of so young in the business that either it went to your head or you just... I was young and stupid. You were? Yes, absolutely yeah. young and stupid. Um... I, I feel like the hit squad thing was was, was awesome and um, we were over and like I said the only reason why I have so many answers now with all my students and stuff is like, oh you have all the answers mm -hmm. yeah because I've made all the mistakes right <laughs> right so you can see now when you see a student right that's starting to get a little buzz around them early and you see the attitude start to change you go whoa whoa like you see it Right. And you can be the guy that goes, no, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly what you're going through. I know what you're doing. And trust me when I tell you that it feels right in this moment, but long term, you're going to regret this. Right. Yeah, because you did that. Mm -hmm. So what was that thing? Like, was it just a matter of you believing your own hype? I mean, it's believing your own hype, being put, and also being put in a position that we were put in. Um but also coming from the indies where it was a dog eat dog world. Right, especially right. in that late 90s, yeah. early 2000s, that getting into, yeah. Was like, listen, you know, either you fight for yours mm -hmm. or it's gonna get taken from you. Yeah, that was kind of the, the end of that sort of fight for your spot era. Like yeah. these are the spots and whoever fights for them gets those spots. And you had to hold that spot because every night somebody was gonna come and try to, you know, hit you on the chin as hard as they could. And they were going to try to light up your dashboard, your check engine light. They would try to, you know, turn on your check engine light. Mm -hmm. You know, and they would literally try to take your spot. 
either if they could not perform you, they were going to take it from you. Uh-huh. And they were going to be the guy. Yeah, we're the guy who knocked you know the hit squad out right we're we're you know we're the guys who who who, who um you know who finally kicked the hit squad's ass yeah because that was an era where it's like if the hit squad if you did get knocked out cold say in a match and it happened to me if you weren't able to get back up or maintain that sort of mystique if you had to get helped out on a stretcher or something like that that's the end of the hit squad right yeah and somebody else gets to wear that as a badge of honor even though it's like you scumbag. You just, I'm trusting you with my body. You knocked me out just so you could be the guy who did that. But that's the world that you lived in. And it wasn't easy for us to make things look as real as they could. Yeah. Safely. Right. I mean, one of the most famous clips of you guys is like you you were a Jersey All Pro would wrestle in this venue where there was a wall right next to the ring. And a ceiling. And the ceiling, right. And your, your calling card became. We used everything around us. Just picking up guys and darting them into the wall or picking guys up and throwing them into the ceiling <laughs> yeah and, and you're the fans right loved it. the fans would lose it because you can't as a fan you're looking at that going you don't that's not you can't do that safely like you look at that going okay they just cripple that man for my amusement <laughs> this yeah. is what they do yeah. i believe them so i mean so guys must have hated you then the fact that you and Ed mac were young guys and you got out of school and you were a hit and and you were making money, and you had that spot, and people were going to Jersey All Pro shows to see you, and people were you know, going to Ring of Honor shows, and and all of a sudden people are talking about you. That was not an era when young success was celebrated by everybody. Right, right. Um, you know, a lot of the um, older guard, mm-hmm. yes, of the, in the independents. It, it was hard coming up because. A lot of places didn't want us because they didn't want change. Right. So. Right, because you brought that sort of authentic, roughneck yeah, style. Something that wasn't being done. No. So, you know, when we walked in the door, you know, or when we would inquire to offer our services for this promotion, it'd be like, nope. Because <laughs> like, half the locker room was saying no. Right. Okay. So. And why was it, was half the locker room saying no because they were legitimately no this doesn't work for us or was it because no well, they're going to come in and take our spots over here we well, don't num- want them here. number one they didn't want to give us a spot number right. two they were scared um because they didn't want to get thrown up in the ceiling number three we were walking into a locker room where it's like okay probably none of you guys have ever gotten into a real fight in your lives right okay and now we're coming in and we're going to totally look different. Because you know what a fight looks like. We're going to be different. Yeah. So it's like bringing chaos mm-hmm. into a church. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. It's like, oh, we don't want this. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's like, hey, and my selling point was, it's like, listen, okay, we're a little rough around the edges. Um, you know, we may be a little crazy, but I guarantee you, that by the end of our match, we will have your entire crowd chanting our name. And we will change the way things are done here. Mm-hmm. And people, more people will come see us. And you, you, listen, you can put us at the bottom of the card. Put us wherever you want. Give us a few months. And you will not have a choice but to main event us. So that's, what you, that's what you have to do. And that's one of those things, right, where you would think a logical person would go like, oh, well, that sounds pretty good. Like, we'll get some new main eventers. You know, he's guaranteeing this is going to work. Okay, great. But the people that are trying to protect their main events and people that are trying to protect, no, we've got a nice way of doing things here, and it's worked out really well for all of us. We don't want disruptors. Disruptors, well, generally, they're good for the overall picture. They're bad for the people that are trying to maintain the status because it's good for them. Yeah, but you also have you also aren't aren't getting any more than 150 people right in your, in your seats. Right, like you want to do you want a main event for 150 people, or do you want to go on maybe semi main event and we'll get 400 people, 300 people, 500 people. Well, the hardest thing was selling it to the promoter first. Yeah, and having the promoter believe in what we were saying 
which was absolutely, we had the, uh, the best intentions. But it's also wrestling where everybody's selling themselves and, right. and, and you know, now carnies the, are everywhere. Now the promoter has to sell this to the talent. So now the promoter ultimately is the end of He says, listen, okay, this is what I want. Okay, I want these guys in. And I said, we tell him, I said, listen, the proof is in the pudding. Look at what we've done here. Mm-hmm. Look at what we've done here. Look at what we've done there. Look at what we've done there. All successful houses, all sellouts, and we're main eventing, and every one of those promotions. I said, so well, well, what we're telling you isn't a lie. Right. But at the same time, you're right. They have to now sell it to the talent, and the talent's not really trying to hear that. Right. Until the talent has dealt that card where, listen, okay, well, this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Then it happens. Mm-hmm. Now you have the talent is a little leery. We are, by nature, we just, we're not shy. And we're not, um, we don't shy away from anything. We we didn't shy away from anything. And I think that the beauty of us was that we didn't crumble in the moment. Um, if we knew you were scared and we knew you were worried, then we would try to fix that in the back before we even walked out of the curtain. Okay, so you're not the type that's like going like, okay, good. Then you're no. going to come out looking scared of us and we're going to take advantage of no. the fact that, yeah. We would try to fix that. Uh-huh. We'd say, listen, what's the problem? What's the matter? What's going on? So look, we've been doing this for such and such, you know, just trust us, man. It's going to be a, and you know what, man? We would go out there and we'd have a match. Mm-hmm. And we would all come back. And now the talent is telling the promoter, these guys are great. <laughs> And the promoter's saying, yeah, I told you. Yeah. And we're turning, we're telling the promoter, you see? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now it's it just took that one. And now the that guy will, and now everyone else was, wait a minute, what are they doing out there? Like, well, you know, well, we want some of that too. Right. So right. now the whole, now we have a locker room that's now, uh, now wants a piece of the hit squad and wants to get in there and mix it up. And that's what we wanted. So what do you think you were doing wrong in that era? Like as, as a young person, as, as a kid that was gone, do you think it was, you weren't sensitive enough to the fact that like logically now, because you've been around for as long as you have, you could see, Oh, I get why people didn't want us around. I get why people didn't like us. They, they weren't right. Mm-hmm. But I understand their perspective now. Cause you've seen as much as you've seen. Do you think that the problem was that you didn't understand their perspective? You just saw a bunch of guys that, didn't want you around and that that bothered you well it it, sometimes it would bother us and sometimes it would motivate us right you know but um either either way you know we we dealt with it right and either we dealt with it by knocking it totally out of the park Mm -hmm. or we not or we dealt with it by earning your respect right you know what was the like like with your case right yeah you were like holy shit John, my God, this guy. Yeah. And then when it was over, I was like, Sam, you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was awesome. That was good stuff. Yeah. You know? But you also probably know that if I'm the type of person that goes like, you can't put your hands on me. Okay, he's not, he shouldn't be here. You know right. what I mean? Like, he shouldn't be here. Well, you know, I would try to probably tell you, listen, Sammy, you, know, you can't be that uptight. Yeah, it's okay. It's wrestling, man. Yeah. You know, I would give you a hug, man. I think, right. See, it's not that bad. Right. Bro. But luckily, like, I've been watching long enough <laughs> yeah. that as soon as I get thrown, I'm like, that was the greatest thing ever. Everybody's yeah. going to love that. And nobody got hurt. Nobody got hurt. Everything. I'm fine. And people are going to remember, like, oh, look at him throw the interview. It was a locker room sellout. It's great. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And everybody got such a kick out of it. Um, so uh, what was the what was the Ring of Honor locker room like back then? Oh, back then. Okay. Because, I mean, that's the very beginning of it. I'm going to rattle off some names to you. Okay. Simone Joe. <laughs> the Hit Squad. Mm-hmm. Loki. Mm-hmm. Doug Williams. Mm-hmm. Dane O'Brien. <laughs> AJ Styles. <laughs> Christopher Daniels. Yeah. Uh, Jody Fleisch. Uh-huh. Um, just try, trying to ask it. Yeah. Uh, the Backseat Boys. Yeah, of course. The SAT. I mean, literally. Xavier. These are, and for those of you, by the way, that don't know, like guys like Xavier and Trent Acid and people like that, because I mean, do some research because these guys are incredible. And every name you just mentioned, Xavier was the second Ring of Honor 
Incredible. World champion. Incredible. You know. And all of them with chips on their shoulders. Yeah, you needed that. Deserve chips on their shoulders, but all of them sitting there going, well, I'm, I'm the best. Yep. Every single person that you just mentioned, I have to believe that in that era is sitting there young, knowing that they're the best. Oh man, we were hungry. Yeah. Man, if you ever, the best way I can describe it, and I was talking to Jay Lethal about this mm-hmm. this weekend in, um, in Georgia. The best way you could, des- you could describe the feeling when you walked through that locker room at the, uh, I believe it was called the, what was it called? Where Ring of Honor? Where, where Ring of Honor first started. Where was it, in Baltimore? No, no, no. It was in Philadelphia. It was called the, the Murphy, right? The Murphy Rec Center. I think that's right. The Murphy yeah, Rec yeah, Center. Yeah. If you walk through that locker room downstairs, mm-hmm. it took you to Rocky Three, where Apollo took Rocky after Mick passed away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He took him back. Let's see, see Rock. You see what they got? They all got the eye of the tiger. They all got that look. It's that we all had that look, that snarl. You know, it's like, but we all knew, and we all respected each other. Right. You know, but we knew we were there for a reason. Right. Yeah, and And I'd have to imagine anybody that came into that environment without that attitude. Yeah, there's no way you'd survive. They weren't there again. Right, right. They weren't there again. So that ends up running its course. How did that end up being done? The, as far as in Ring of Honor, the first time. How was it? How was everything done? No, no, no. How did you end up being all finished with the first time around Ring of Honor? Okay. Um, the first time I uh, ended up uh, with the whole Ring of Honor thing, I had broken away from the Hit Squad. Mm-hmm. Um, right, because that's when they decided that the I mean the Hit Squad had done everything that the Hit Squad can do. Right. As a tag team. Right. Now it's time to see what you and Mac can do separately. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, the office was really, well, Gabe was really interested in seeing, um, you know, where, where I, I well, he, he knew I had a lot of range. Yeah. Um, and he, he knew that in some facets of, some on some aspects of it, I was kind of being held back being in a team is like well you know who's going to be a mid carter as a team mm-hmm. and you're never going to really know um he says the time is now you know and a lot of other promoters were feeling the same way so were you feeling that way i was scared yeah i was scared because um i didn't know anything else right i was always with steve and all you'd known is success with that and all i had known was success right and you know and when I wasn't sure of something, I sat under the I sat under the learning tree for a long time mm-hmm. because I was the least experienced out of out of the two of us. Mm-hmm. And I sat under the homicide and low key learning tree forever. And you know, and the whole thing with Steve, you know, um, he was a little more experienced than I was. He wasn't working a lot, but he was very experienced. And he had to be patient, and he had to show me the way. But when we finally clicked, it clicked, it clicked hard. Right. And now we're in Ring of Honor. And now it's like, okay. You guys have done everything you can do. Uh-huh. <clears throat> like, what's next? Yeah. You know? So it's all right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna try to do this. You know, Steve, you know, Steve, Steve didn't like it. Um, understandably, you know, I, if I was in the same position, I wouldn't have liked it either. Um, I was being a little more favored. Sure. At the time, they were, they, they were showing um, some less uh, interest than Steve. Steve kind of saw the writing on the wall. You know, he wasn't too happy about it. Um, I was worried. Because I was like, okay, well, if this doesn't happen, uh, we're either going to be made quarters or we're not going to be here too long. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's it one like of those a, things, too. Like when somebody, like at a job, right? If somebody comes to you with a promotion and they go like, here, we got this for you. And you say, no, thank you. I'm comfortable where I'm at. You're probably not going to be at the job too long, right? Yeah. 
They're going to be okay. All right, yeah, you stay here. You then. got it then. You got you it. Stay here. Yeah, yeah. Stay comfortable. And then six months down the road, <sighs> the position's no longer a position. Yeah. We're, we're, we're terminating the position. We're it's not you. We're it's... restructuring <laughs> the position. You yeah, get exactly. one of those. Exactly. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought we were good here. No, uh, we're good. But how about that other thing we talked about? No, no, no. That's off the yeah, table. Position's been filled. <laughs> yeah. George, uh, Georgie uh, filled it already. Yeah, isn't he doing great, by yeah. the way? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah so... I mean, that's how it goes. Right. I mean, it's the cold, hard truth. That's how it is. Right. So we went ahead and we, we did what we did. And, uh, man, I, uh, Gabe told me, he says, you're going to hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. I said, really? He says, yeah, you're going to hit the ground running, man. I'm going to strap the rocket to you, and we're going to go. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. I said, well, well, what are we going to do? He says, I'm going to put you with Christopher Daniels. You're going to be in the prophecy, and you're going to be the first guy to pin smoke, Joe. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> and lo and behold, that's what, that's what he did. And, uh, and I've seen Gabe before, and, and I've told him this, and I just, I just felt like it was too much too soon. For me to handle. Now, right now, Danny Moff today, the Bayonne badass, he would not have no problem handling the the handling the the pressure. You know, the, the pressure to produce and the pressure in the spotlight and okay, this is the spot. Yeah, I like it. I love it. Give me more pressure. Pressure's a privilege. And I'm a firm believer that right. pressure is a pri is a privilege. Right. And I mean, it's opportunity, right? That's why it feels the way it feels. I mean, the reason pressure is pressure is because this could either go really good or really bad. But that's what opportunity feels like. Yeah. And somebody, somebody believes in you enough right. to put that pressure on your lap. Yep. And believes that you can handle and believes that you can produce. Let's go. But. I mean, the way we're wired, there are times in our lives when we can handle it. There are times in our lives when we can't. Like, there are times, like, you need life experience. Exactly. Before you can really know. You can go like, oh, it's really great that they think that I could do it. But if you don't know that you can do it, because you haven't had that experience, there's not much you could do, right? But I feel like if I wouldn't have... And I wouldn't necessarily say I failed, mm -hmm. but if I wouldn't admit that, hey, that was too much too soon for me, mm -hmm. you know, um, I didn't know how to handle that position at that moment, at that time. Mm -hmm. But I do now. Like, that got me ready for now. Right. I mean, there's something nice about it. Like, because when you're young and you see other people getting opportunities, this is wrestling, this is anything, any walk of life. You're young, you see other people getting opportunities, you get jealous, you get insecure, you get like, why not me? Like, I'm ready for that. He shouldn't get that opportunity, I should get that opportunity. And then you move on in your life and you you know, whether you got the opportunity or not, you know, you know what, I it's a good thing I didn't get that opportunity. Yeah, I wasn't ready for it. And lo and behold, you see the guy that did get the opportunity? Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, it didn't work out for him because yeah. he was in the same boat as you. Yeah. He wasn't ready for it either. Absolutely. And it's sometimes a blessing when you don't get the opportunity. You know. Absolutely. You know, I see that. I see that a lot of times um, in the real world, and yeah, you know, and, and, and wrestling. It's like, okay, sometimes it's a blessing, right? In disguise, you know, not to get everything that you wanted right okay but you're getting what you need yes which is the experience yes which is the hurt yeah it's got to hurt a little bit mm -hmm. and you know and, and, and you're getting the experience of how to last how to ride the wave how to come back and you tough times don't last tough people do yes you know and you have to ride through that you gotta keep going man and you also make these connections that you have no idea the relationships that you make along the way, you don't know until 10 years oh, yeah. later how important this one was or that one was. We talked about Pat Buck. This one right here. I mean, there's so many people that I talked to from Jersey All Pro that like when I was going down and just doing shows and doing commentary and going to either Jersey City or Rawway once a month, 
it was just like cool. I wanted to do some commentary on the indies, and this is I had no idea how many of those people would be in my life today just through happenstance. It's incredible. It's incredible. It blows yeah. my mind all the time. It blows my mind, especially because after Ring of Honor, you considered leaving wrestling for a period of time, right? Right. And you decided to come back as a solo act, back to Jersey All Pro, back to back to where you had been as a tag team act. Um, and once five, five years, five four or five years, it took I took off. Wow. Yeah. Do you ever regret that knowing like, okay, that's four or five years that could have been, I could have been growing, I could have been in my prime, this could have happened, that could have happened, or knowing what you know now and based on where you're at now, are you going, maybe that's what I needed then? Every day, you know, I think about it. Um, but I also say, maybe I needed that, those four or five years for my body to heal. Yeah, because I mean, you know, and you hear it all the time, I know. People are in awe of the stuff that you can do today based on not only how long you've been doing it, but the level to which you've been doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's prob you're probably right. Taking that period where you got four or five years to yeah. let the body rest, you get to start up again instead of putting that damage. I don't think if you've been wrestling on that level for an additional four or five years in the middle there, Today doesn't look like today, right? Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Um, you know, and, and, and I needed that itch. Mm -hmm. You know, I needed that itch. I needed to miss it. I think I needed to miss it. Yeah. To get better at it. And I think that's when I figured wrestling out when I was out that time. So were you still, like, you didn't, when you left, you didn't just cold turkey, I don't want anything to do with wrestling. I'm done with wrestling. Oh, no. You were still... The same level, you you were a fan. I think I became a bigger fan. Yeah. Because now I'm wrestling. Now I'm totally in in, in tune on Monday nights. I was watching the um, the Tough Enoughs. Yes. I was watching, you know, I was still watching the old stuff. Yeah. But every day I was watching wrestling, and I was just, I was just studying. One of the things that, like, just, I wanted to figure out was, okay, Ric Flair. Mm -hmm. He did all these great American bashes and everything. And I hear the legend of him doing seven uh, Broadways, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes two a day. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how did he do this? So I said, let me see how he did it. So I would watch, I would religiously watch his matches. I was like, wow. This is how he did this. Is how he did sixty minutes. This is how he held people at attention for sixty minutes. Yeah. This is how he lasted the sixty minutes. And I was like, yeah, well, I would watch it over and over and over and over. Sometimes with no sound. Just to get the body movement. Right. Just to understand the body language and understand how he's using every single tool in the toolbox mm -hmm. to make this something that he can do. Night in, night out. Night in, night out. Night in, night out. Him and Steemo were just masters. Yeah. Him and Dusty. Mm -hmm. You know, Dusty, was, he didn't look like he was physically, uh, you know, able to do 60 minutes, but he went out there and did them. Yeah. And not once in a, not once a month. Yeah. Yeah. Every night. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, this, those are the things that, like, they would blow my mind. I was like, and then I would watch. And at the same, in the same token, mm -hmm. I would watch... Joe versus Punk. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna see how these guys did it at a different level. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I was like, this is amazing. I wanna get to that level one day, you know? And um, But that's so interesting that you were away from wrestling and you still, that's how you know you weren't done. Cause you still had that thing. You wouldn't be studying. Cause you're not watching as a fan. You're studying yeah. to figure out how it's done so you can do it. Which means you know, at some point, you're bound to come back. It was my magnificent obsession. Yeah. Every day, yeah. I watched this, and I would fall asleep with the control in my hand. Mm -hmm. You know, I would always fall asleep with the control in my hand and watching stuff every day, every single day. And by the way, this is before WWE Network. This is before all that yes. stuff. So this is when you actually had to do some work. Yes. 
to get all this footage, right? Yeah. So just watching everything and everything, watching it over and over and over and over again. It was just like, and then at this one point, it's just, I said, I'm ready. And I called Frank. Who was running Jersey All Pro. Yeah. yeah. And he said, hello? I said, Danny? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, holy God. <laughs> he said, hold on a second. I said, what? He said, hold on. So I hear some rubbish. He says, all right, I'm back. He says, what, what, what'd you do? He said, I stood up. <laughs> I only have one question for you. I said, I called you. He said, shut up. I have one question for you. He says, what? I said, are you ready? I said, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. He said, let's go. Like, right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I don't need a whole, like, five years later, it's a one-sentence conversation. That's it. And you were ready. That was it. And you were back in. Yeah, man, because, I mean, and that must have been right around the time that I met you. Yes. You know, within that year. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea. When you came around, it was, like, it was Kenny Omega was our champion. Yep. It was the, very, it was the tail end of Kenny Omega's. The Jersey Hill, All Pro. The Hillbilly Wrecking Crew. Love the Hillbilly Wrecking Crew. Those guys, those guys, you talk about the hits squad being scary. They literally, I'm sitting there. I was scared. <laughs> you were. Why, why, with those guys walking around. So the Hillbilly Wrecking Crew was, uh, it was Brody Lee, who's, you know, Luke Harper. Necro Butcher. Necro Butcher. And this was when Necro Butcher was at Necro Butcher Prime. Uh, Trevor Murdoch. Trevor did come in. Yeah. The Briscoes. The Briscoes came in. This Nick was, Nick Gage, yes, this Nick is Gage, and, this, and I mean Nick Gage. Not I feel like Nick Gage has uh, has gained a level of appreciation. Oh, yeah. This was terrifying, Nick Gage. Yeah, like I was I was sitting there going like, okay, this is fun to be at this show, but I'm not getting promos from, from those guys. I'm I'm not doing it. And let me tell you something. It was that was chaos. But again, you need chaos. Yeah. They had the hit squad. Yeah. They didn't have it anymore. Right. They need chaos. It was one of those things where I was like, I want to, I mean, even sitting there working there, I was like, I want to see what the Hillbilly Wrecking Crew is going to do on this show. Because it's going to be a thing. And then when the record, when the Hillbilly Wrecking Crew jumped on me and Lethal. Yes. And we stopped fighting each other to fight against them. Yeah. It was like, wow. It was like Jersey All Pro. The Pandora's box had opened again. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, like, you know, you're talking about Rahway. You're talking about Jersey City. You're talking about towns mm -hmm. where hillbillies <laughs> and people who put, you know. And their promos were like. Dude. Right on the <laughs> edge of. <coughs> I mean, it was not. Right a, on the edge of HR disasters. Yeah. You know I was I sitting mean? there going like, and I mean, you teetering, one foot dangling. <laughs> You want over to and about, like I'm like don't yeah. you I, like we are one step away from burning a cross <laughs> yeah <laughs> in this yeah. in this building you want to talk about it you know uh, and, 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 oh, oh man yeah but it was great yeah it was great and it was like they were you you there was no choice but to boo them it wasn't even like cool to cheer them you booed them for all the right reasons yeah. and, they loved, and then you they and lethal like them. yeah yeah and how could you not? And also, I mean, you and Lethal had established yourselves to the point where you were kind of that babyface lifeblood yeah. of Jersey All Pro. You I were was the a tried and holding true. fan. Yes, yes. And he was the kid who walked in the door. Yes. And so it was like, what better fabric and fiber than yeah that? Which happens to be. The opposite side, which happens to be the hillbilly wrecking crew. Right. Which hated anything of color. Yes. Yes. So it was like the perfect, it was the perfect storm, man. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. When, uh, when Jersey All Pro kind of petered out, were you worried that you're like, oh, this was, this was like my thing. This was magic. Yeah. And I don't think I'm going to feel this way again. I mean, I'm sure I'll work. I'm sure there's going to be matches there's going to be gigs there's going to be this but i'm not going to have that place that we can create 
magic here. This is my home. This is, mm. this is we're we're creating here. We're not. I'm not just going and working a spot. Right. Right. Were you worried that that was gone when Jersey All Pro was gone? Oh yeah. 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 You know, um, when Jersey All Pro went through their uh, through their phase of, like you said, petering out. Uh, I was worried because I wasn't working on a national level. I wasn't traveling mm -hmm. all around the country. Mm -hmm. I was either working for Jersey All Pro and Parisian Syndicate and um, Ace. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's all I had. That's a third right there. Jersey All Pro goes away. That's that's a big chunk. Yeah, that's all I had. So I was like, oh, man. Was like, that was a big blow. Mm-hmm. To indie wrestling. Especially because Jersey All Pro, up until the very end, one of the dependable, and at this time, right, this is not the indie wrestling boom that we're in now. Like, it was not a guarantee. It was a difficult thing to run an independent wrestling promotion in that sort of end of the first decade of the 2000s into the second decade. Like, 2008 to 2012, 2013, it was not an easy time on the independents. Um and having Jersey All Pro there consistently running every single month to good crowds. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't much like that going on then. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and a lot of buildings, a lot of other, a couple other promotions tried to run the building and they just, it wasn't the same buzz. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It yeah. It's not the same. But interestingly, and this is a great story, and obviously Pat Buck has been on podcast a couple of times, but. Mm -hmm. Pro Wrestling Syndicate is another uh, company, an independent company that's running same time as Jersey All Pro and continues on after Jersey All Pro. Pro Wrestling Syndicate starts running more regularly, starts to get a little bit more organized, a little bit more cohesive, starts to have these storylines like we talked about. Pat Buck gets involved with Pro Wrestling Syndicate, which I believe that's how you met Pat, correct? Yes. Pro Wrestling Syndicate, the owner, and Pat end up parting ways. Mm -hmm. The original owner is going to get to keep whatever pro wrestling syndicate becomes. And Pat Buck is going over here to start this company called wrestle pro. And the plan for wrestle pro is to run consistently, you know, hopefully every month and to run the old Rawway rec center, that Jersey all pro used to run. And here you are at the top of the bill, at the top of the bill as a key figure in, we want you to kind of be the lifeblood of, Russell, bro. Yeah. I mean, it's I, 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 it's wild. And that was almost the way that you just said it. Mm -hmm. Pat came to me in practice one day. Yeah. He said, hey, listen. He I got to talk to you. I said, what's up? He talked to me and he talked to Mo. He said, this, this, this is happening. Which, by the way, I mean, it's so funny that you bring up like, Mo Sexton, Mario Bocara, who is, is big in Wrestle Pro, is this whole other thing. But I'm sitting here going, "You mean Mo Sexton from the Southside Players Club? You mean that? Mo? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like these yeah. are these are all." The, and that's what I mean about about uh, never knowing the people exactly. you encounter, the people that you end up with a relationship yeah. with. Like, maybe they won't show up next month, and you'll never see them again. Maybe they'll be around for the next. 15 years maybe you'll know him for the rest of your life right yeah maybe you'll become part of their lives you know? right exactly i mean listen because of wrestle pro i was i was in pat bunk's wedding mm -hmm. um myself and mario walker are best friends we consider ourselves brothers mm -hmm. um sean donovan and myself excellent we're best friends mm -hmm. um i have a godson mm -hmm. uh, i'm godfather to craig seal's son so it's, you know, that building, that company has meant so much to me. Yeah. And is that where you first started training to, or were you training before? I was training, I was working on teaching other people in other places, but never to the extent like there. Right. Where Pat said, listen, this is my coach. So, um... He said, I had practice, and Pat said, listen, this is happening. Um, we're going to split up, and this and this and this is going to happen. And I need to know, like, where my guys are. And without hesitation, 
I said to him, I looked at him. And I said, brother, I said, you have my support a thousand percent. I'll go to war with you right now. I'll run, I'll run through a fire with you. How did, what was it about Pat that gave you that feeling? Because like you said, it's he not. He never lied to me. Yeah. Because you hadn't known him for 20 years. Pat never lied to me. Pat's always been, like, Pat's always looked at me in the eye, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. He's looked at me in the eye. He's never lied to me. Ever. Mm-hmm. Ever, ever, ever. And whatever Pat has said to me, he's delivered. Always. And I learned so much from Pat. I learned a lot about character. Not not always answering or doing what your heart tells you to do. Sometimes sometimes doing the right thing really, really stinks. Mm-hmm. But you have to do it. Right. And those are certain qualities that I learned from Pat that I didn't even learn, like, from my dad. Mm-hmm. You know, where uh, it's like, hey, man, I was already a grown man, but there were certain man qualities that I needed to learn, like that of, hey, you just can't, like, blow off steam just because you're a 300-pound gorilla. <laughs> and half the room is scared of you. You know, you just can't rule by force all the time sometimes you have to do sometimes the right thing to do is to sit back and let things breathe let things happen and uh you know sometimes doing the right thing isn't always the the most fun option right yeah in your head you're like i could i can take care of this in five seconds if i just yell and intimidate everybody will shut up and they'll just do what I say. But then you'll be the, the topic of negative press. 100%. For six months. Right. So that's where Pat really took me in. I sat under his tree and I learned a lot from him and Hawkins. Yeah. Um, you know, so like I said, I'm grateful. Yeah, Pat, because I mean. Pat turned my career around, man. And I mean, I don't know if you guys remember this or not, because we, we've talked to Hawkins about it before on the podcast, but that however long it was, year or two that he was gone from WWE. He was a huge part of Wrestle Pro. Yeah. Hawkins was. I mean, yes. he, he created Pro, Hawkins School. He created with Pat, which is in conjunction with Wrestle Pro, which is in conjunction with the school that you it's started, there. started teaching. Yeah, in Rawway. Like, there's the Long Island School and there's the Rawway School, right? Right. So, when you get the call and Ring of Honor goes, hey, man, remember us? <laughs> <laughs> and goes like you know we're, we're we're interested first of all how did you find out that after all this time ring of honor wants you and second of all how did you feel knowing that yes this might be the best news of your life but at the same time it means kind of stepping away from this thing that you've been building well it's funny because a few months ago I had a text of Pat. I said, Pat, I don't know why I'm still doing this. I said, I think I'm just going to finish the year out, man. I'm just going to go home. You know? <laughs> it's, that's so funny. I'm laughing because it's not the first time, even recently, that I've talked to somebody yeah. who's told me the exact same thing. I think I'm going to finish this year out, and then they end up getting a call from somebody. And it changes everything. But go on. I didn't mean to interrupt you. And Pat said to me, don't you dare. <laughs> says, don't quit. Don't give up. Mm-hmm. First of all, it's not you. Second of all, that's not what we've worked on. Says, there's so much left to do. And wrestling is going through a boom right now. And there's so many opportunities out there. This is your year. Something's going to happen. Something's got to happen, dude. You're too good to be left out here. Something is going to happen. I guarantee you something's going to happen. Again, okay. <laughs> All right. He's and Pat's a, never wrong. He's not. He's not. <laughs> yeah. Next thing you know, uh, Kevin Matthews uh, calls me. He says, hey, Scott DeMore uh, is, wants, wants to talk to you. Mm-hmm. I said, really? He said, yeah, man, they want to talk. You know, something's on the table. They're ready to roll. I said, cool. I 
week to Scott. We're all set. We're ready to go. Yeah. Scott's obviously running things that impact. Right. Right. We're ready to go. Okay, yeah, we're going to go with this, man. Here we go. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen. Okay, we're two weeks away. Mm -hmm. My phone rings. It's called Cabana. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uncle. By what the way, doing? another friend that I'm sure you met years ago, yeah. that who know, and now here he is. Yeah. What you doing? He's like, I, I'm talking to you. <laughs> he says, hey, are you available such and such date? I said, yeah. As a matter of fact, I am. He says, uh, good, good. Would you be interested in working uh, PCO? I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I've done that before. Yeah, cool. I said, for who? You guys did it in WrestlePro, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, remember. I said, for who? Mm -hmm. Do you mind me asking? He said, oh, I'll bring him on her. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll bring him on her. He says, uh, they let me book this show called Uncensored. Unscripted or Uncensored. And um, I got 100% of the book, and that's the match I want. I love because I saw that promo when Colt did the promo and announced the match and everything. I love that that's legit. Yeah. That he really did have control of the book and he really did call you and the whole thing. But go on. Yeah, he said, well, you know, the office signed off on it, so here I am. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, well, my people are going to call your, you. I have no people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, my people are going to call your people. And this is how we're going to. I said, all right, cool. So I'm like, I'm still like, wait, what? Right. Do you believe it? Or are you still like, this is wrestling and a million things could happen before I get that phone call? So now I'm saying to myself, wait a minute. I'm doing this thing on Sunday. <laughs> I was supposed to fight PCO on Sunday. Yeah. And. Thursday, I'm supposed to debut on Impact. I said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? Okay. So I, I let Cole know. He said, oh, no, just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so I went out there. I said, they flew me out a day early. Ring of Honor, then. Yeah, they flew me out to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, because the match I was going to have with PCO was in in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So they flew me into Pittsburgh. I'm like, why are they flying me into Pittsburgh? Yeah. I'm like, maybe they want promos or something. I don't know. I have no idea. I show up. And I'm looking. And I'm just looking around. Saying, this is not the Ring of Honor I remember. Huge setup. <laughs> Big, huge screens. Giant Trons. This is the production. Yeah. It's a TV show. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. This is incredible. Yeah. The team of trucks outside. And I'm like, okay. Wow. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the top. I'm minding my own business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you still don't really know why you're there. No. Right. You just show up at a time. And you're there at that time. Yeah. And now I'm going to sit and wait for somebody to tell me why I'm here. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I've known through the years that when you go somewhere like that, you just fly under the radar. You just sit. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get anybody's way, mm -hmm. but you you don't hide either. Right. So I'm sitting on the uh, second level. and I'm just looking at the setup and I'm admiring everything. And here comes the office. Hey, Dan. <laughs> hey, what's up? I said, uh, remember I told you you didn't have a match tonight? I said, yeah, you have a match tonight. He said, okay. <laughs> I said, all right. He said, yeah. So I'm figuring it's pre-show. Right. I'm like, pre-show? He said, no, no, no. I mean, that. What? I said, why? Exactly. That's yeah. I said, why? He said, yeah. You're like, you didn't so, even tell me to bring my gear. I mean, I have it, but. So, I go, yeah, it's, uh, you, uh, you, Marty, and PCO are teaming up. 
I said, who are we working? I said, oh, you're going to work uh, uh, Colt, Cheeseburger, and uh, Jeff Cobb. Okay, oh, okay. All right. All right. We <laughs> can get up. We get changed. <laughs> yeah, I'm change. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, oh my god, you know, what's going on again? Am I ready? You know. Yeah. Man. You know, but went out there. You know, God bless those guys. They uh, they did as much as they could to feature me in that match. Incredible. Very giving souls. All the guys in that match. And uh, it was great, you know. As I hit the ground running, I uh, we went through. We did the finish, and the match was great. You know, I'm like, wow, I just did this. Oh man! And now the next night, and, uh, which, by the way, like just the fact that that match happened, that's enough of a high, right? Yeah, like that's the high you're riding off of. Like well, I just main evented a Ring of Honor show with those right. guys, and that's not even why I'm here. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I come back the next day. Yeah. That's okay. Now you're gonna do this. Is that right? I look at the card. But where am I on the card? You mean it right again? It's peace. Yeah. Okay. Talk about hitting the ground running. Yeah, oh, oh, okay. And by the way, hitting the ground running for God knows what, because as far as you were concerned, you were coming to Pittsburgh just to go to Dayton for one match. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's that's it. And, yeah. now, and now you're getting ready for your second Ring of Honor main event of the weekend. Yeah, so I have the match with PCO. Carl is incredible. Mm -hmm. He's not a human. Mm hmm He's not human. No way he's human. I mean, it's incredible to, like... It's not only about, like, the reinvention of the character. Like, thinking about the fact that in 93, I'm watching that guy on Monday Night Raw. And I'm watching him do... Not just the fact that he's a different character. I'm watching him do more with his body. Now. And wrestle longer matches. Now. And be on that other level. Now. Than he was even then. It's amazing. It's literally amazing. And the fact that he'll do anything. He'll just destroy himself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> to hurt you. Which is right up your alley, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, we were like the perfect opponents for each other. Yeah. I love Carlo. Carl's a good guy. And uh, getting to know him a little more now is even more of a blessing. Yeah. He's one of those people that I'm actually happy that I've gotten to know, like you. Mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Um, so I have the match with Carl. And God bless Carl. You know, he did whatever he could to do, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was awesome. And I came back from the match. You know, was, everybody was clapping and everything. And, you know, it was great. And then we had a meeting right after. So I'm still pulling tax out of my head. <laughs> and we're at, at a team meeting. <laughs> and uh, after the team meeting, uh, the team leader says, uh, damn mouth, you know, uh, what can I say? You came in here, you know, after 15 years, 20 years, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you main event both nights and you totally knocked it out of the park you absolutely killed it just can't say enough about you you know so the hats off to you and somebody from the back of the room till this day I don't know who it is says well give him an effing job and you're just like so the rest of the locker room starts chanting yes really yeah wow yeah. So, uh, what a difference a decade makes. A couple decades. Yeah. From 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 that first day in that locker room to having a locker room chanting yes, yes, yes for you. Yeah, and that was probably one of the most humbling experiences of my life, man. Yeah. To have that locker room. You know. 
<clears throat> Sorry. Well, no, I mean, you don't realize <sighs> yeah. that you have the support that you have until you get that kind of visualization of it, right? When you're just working your shows and doing your best to get noticed and do good matches, you don't know if anybody's noticing or not. Right. <sighs> but, uh, team leader stopped and he said uh, okay he says I don't do this I don't do this type of thing normally and this isn't a thing these are things that are really done in private he says but he's like uh, let's just do it out in public he says do you guys think damn I deserves a job here <laughs> And they just started chanting yes, yes, even louder. And then he's like, he's like, well, Dan, he says, you know, if, if you want the job, the job is yours. But, you know, we, we got up. He got up. I walked across the room and shook his hand, and the place, the locker room just erupted. Wow. And uh, What a welcome in. Yeah, I said, we're a family here. And, you know, come on in, man, become part of the family. And uh, that was that was one of the most special moments of my career, and uh, I'll never forget it. Yeah, I'll never forget it. I mean, talk about realizing <laughs> that you're making the right decision. Yeah, you know what I mean. Wow, that's incredible. I don't think anybody's got a story like that <laughs> about their first time in. But now, Sam, the problem is. Yeah. Yeah, because oh, I, I know what's be, coming up on Thursday. I have to be on Thursday. <laughs> so I which, by the way, wonderful people over there too. So I immediately uh, <laughs> you know, spoke to. Uh, believe I told I, I I explained the team leader and someone said, hey, you know, I have this thing and I have to be over there. So he says, you honor your commitments. You know, do whatever you gotta do. So Impact reached back to me and said, hey, you know, hope everything went well over there, but uh, are we still good for Thursday? I feel like actually things went really well over there. Says, yeah, you know, things went really, really well. I says, you know, is, it, is there any offer or like is so kind of shared whatever was. Uh, yeah was said and uh you know two impacts uh in respect to impact they didn't BS me. Uh -huh. They're like, well we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Uh we can't even come in that ballpark. I'm assuming you and Ring of Honor discussed numbers and terms Outside of the locker room meeting, yes, yeah, not in front of everybody. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, that the didn't negotiation happen. didn't happen right. in front of the locker room, right? <laughs> so you know, Impact said to me, "Said this, we, we just we can't we can't do that." Yeah, and uh, that's good that they didn't string you along, right? Yeah. So, to me, it was a no brainer. Um, to me, I had already felt, I had felt the generic rush mm -hmm. it was real mm -hmm. I lived it mm -hmm. and Ring of Honor is where I wanted to be mm -hmm. and I was like I had no problem calling them back and saying listen I'm I'm not even showing up this is where I want to be and uh, it's, it's been you know we have, again I've hit the ground running yeah, are you kidding me? Yeah, so uh Yeah, I mean and, and you're back to, and you're and you're there working with Jeff Cobb, teaming with Jeff Cobb. I mean it's it's that they're calling us Thanos and Hulk. <laughs> it's been amazing. How is he by the way? Cuz I mean I I find him to be one of the most interesting to watch performers in the world. He's the most freakishly strong human being I've ever met in my life. I'll bet. Yeah. I'll bet. Man, so strong. Well, that is such a nice, such a kind demeanor. Mm hmm. But so strong. I guess you can be when you're that strong. Yeah. You can be as nice as you want yeah. when you're the strongest guy in the room. I also, I got him into uh, Sour Patch uh, Octopus Gummy Bear. <laughs> I 
Yes. <laughs> that's an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like getting Jeff Cobb to eat sweets is an accomplishment. So, uh, you know, what, what's it been? Two, three weekends on the road with Ring of Honor that you've done? Uh, it was my first one, which was the whole Pittsburgh day. And loop. Right. It was the uh, Baltimore... The Philadelphia Loop, and now it's this one. So this will be my this third, third loop, yeah. And are you loving it? I absolutely love it. Yeah, um, I feel like I've been reborn again. Is it wild to you after all these years to have the security that comes with being a contracted performer? You know, I don't know if people can really appreciate, and I'm sure you know. You think about your own jobs. You know, the fact that you know that you are there to perform you're there to show up to wrestle you're wanted there you have a contract that you're going to be able to show up to wrestle there for however long the contract is you know what i mean is there a sort of weight off your shoulders with the whole thing absolutely yeah Uh, it's like okay you know here we go. It's like working and taking nothing away from any company that I've ever worked for. Of course. But now it's like this, okay, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. The production trucks are here. Yeah. Production is here. You know, this is real. There's a catering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a catering. Um, you know, top notch, you know, um, travel. You know. We might finally see a Dan Moth action figure. <laughs> Yeah. Right? You know, that would be a... After all that we might actually see... Can you listen to this? A Dan Moff action figure. <laughs> well, right. I mean, man, you know how much I love this story, and uh, I'm glad we were able to to sit down and tell it. Um, and we should do this again, man. This is this has been really good. Yeah. And congrats, I mean, congrats on everything. I'm sure you know. Thank you, thank you. How happy I and it seems like everybody is for you, because it's nice to see... It's nice to see good things happen to good people, and it's good for everybody to watch somebody who deserves it as much as you get it. Thank you, sir. You know what I mean? And I think that it's a great lesson. If there's any takeaway, it's don't quit. Don't man. quit. Don't quit. Tough times don't last. Tough people do. That's it, man. Don't give up. Always show up with a smile on your face. Yeah. And always do your job the best you can. Yep. And that's what you do. And watch Ring of Honor. That's, <laughs> and that's the other lesson. Watch Ring of Honor and see Dan Moth on an international scale. Yeah. Clean house. Yep. And, by the way, you guys got Marty Scroll re-signed. That's pretty good news for you, too. That's, 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 not, yeah. that's not a bad little signing you guys got. That's, that's, pretty, that's, pretty, pretty, that's, that's pretty pretty cool right Pretty there. good. Pretty yeah. good. It looks like it's going to be a not-too-bad year for Ring of Honor. Yeah, the villain is going nowhere. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much, man. Sam, thank you so much, my friend. I love the place. I love you. And uh, cheers to you, man. And how you've evolved and how you've grown and how you've uh, moved on from holding a microphone in front of a JP. Uh, yeah. Well, I appreciate that, but if, if 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 Ring of Honor ever runs the Rawway Rec Center, I want to come down and do promos. You got it. <laughs> That's done, done deal. Thanks, man. <laughs> All right, man.